So that's where we're picking up today in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 14. It says that the Lord said to Moses, the Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand a staff that turned into a serpent. That's one of the cool uh, things, that miracles that God gave him. And he says, and you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you. Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Verse 17, thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. So the fish in the Nile, they'll, they'll die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over their canals, over their ponds, over their pools of water, so that they may become blood, and there shall be blood throughout all of the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and of stone. So basically every single, not just the water that they, that, that's, that's moving, the water that's, but even the water they've already gathered. So there's not, there won't be any water left. It says, then Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and he struck the water in the Nile. And all the water in the Nile turned into blood and the fish in the Nile, they died and the Nile stank. So that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. This there was blood throughout all of the land of Egypt. So this is the first plague that God sends to the Egyptians and, and sends to, um, to Pharaoh. And so in this, the, the next two weeks, this week and next week, we're going to be looking at these plagues. And there's very, some really significant stuff that we can see in these plagues. As I grew up in church and grew up in uh, Sunday school and different things like that, we always had like the felt board things. And we had the, the little plagues, the, the blood and, the, and the, the flies and the gnats and all these different things. And like I always just had an idea, it was just like this kind of this, this thing that just happened kind of quickly and it was just, a, a, just something that, that God did to like basically punish the Egyptians so they would let Pharaoh go or let the, uh, the Israelites go. But as I studied it and was studying for this, this series, I found out there's a lot more deeper stuff in this. And in fact, that it wasn't just an attack on the king and the Egyptians, that these plagues that we're going to be looking at, they weren't just an attack on the king and the Egyptians, they're actually an attack also on, <clears throat> excuse me, the gods of the Egyptians. Every single one of these attacks is actually runs parallel with a god that the Egyptians worshipped. So it wasn't just an attack on the king and the people that who were oppressing God's people. It was an attack on the gods that they worshipped. These ten plagues were a direct assault on false gods. It was not just happenstance. It was not just God trying to shake things up a little bit and, and torment them so they would say yes. There was actually a specific reason God did these specific 10 things. And in this, we see that God is revealing that he has power over his creation. As we look at these different 10 plagues, and if you know about them, you, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Because all of these plagues were his creation doing things. And that God has power over that. And that it's idolatry to worship his creation over the creator. But that's actually what that was happening with these people, that they had actually lifted up these different gods that we're going to look at here, and they were worshiping the creation over the creator, which is a form of idolatry. And so in these plagues, there's a deeper message here than just attacking on false gods and idols. It even goes deeper than that. There's also a redemptive story. And we see as we're reading this, as we read through this, that God is continuing to give Pharaoh a chance. Let me go back to a couple of scriptures here and I'll show you this. It says, you shall know that I am the Lord. So God is continuing to give Pharaoh a chance to know that God, that, that, that Moses is serving, that the Israelites are serving, is the one true God. It's not just God saying, let my people go. No, God is actually revealing who he is, how powerful he is, that he is the one true God, that he is the God that's worthy of worship, and he's calling them to them. And what he's trying to get Pharaoh to do, what he's trying to get the Egyptians to do, he's not just trying to punish them. What he's actually trying to do is call them to him. If we read in the New Testament, we see that Jesus says, it's my desire that none should perish. But when I've read these Old Testament stories, sometimes you get this, this misconception, or at least I have, 
that there's good guys and bad guys. Have you ever done that when you read a story of David and Goliath, Moses and Pharaoh? Like you get these pictures of like a good guy and a bad guy. But I think that's a false narrative because through the eyes of God and through the eyes of Jesus, we see that his desire is that none should perish. And so in this story, as we're seeing God send these plagues down on the Egyptians and even down on Pharaoh, it's not God attacking them. It's God attacking their God because God wants to have relationship with them. So even in these plagues, as they look like they're just hard things that God's doing to the people that are persecuting his people, it's God still saying, God, choose me. Like God wants to redeem them. God is trying to get them, and we'll see in this story, that God's trying to get Pharaoh's heart to turn, for Pharaoh to repent from the gods that they're worshiping, and to follow and worship the one true God. And this is so cool, because this is, every time I've read this story, I've, not, I've never seen that redemption story. I've always looked at Pharaoh as the bad guy. But if, you, if, if today, if, you'll, if you will, and, in, and next week even, allow yourself to maybe even consider that you might be a little bit like Pharaoh, then you'll see that you might need some of the same redemption opportunities that these people got. And so some really good stuff here. So when we look at this story, when you look at the, that they're worshiping these false idols, I think it's easy for us today to say, like, I, you know, I don't have any idols in my house. I don't know about you, but I don't have any statues with, like, bull heads on them, you know, that have candles lit around. Or, you know, I don't have anything like that. I don't have a, a temple with any sculpted, you know, uh, uh, flies or gnat-headed beast that I go and sacrifice animals to. And so we could look at these stories and go, I don't have anything in common with these. Like, we don't do idols like that. We don't have things like that. But I want, I want to show you a scripture. This is in Isaiah talking about idols. It says that their land is full of idols. It says they bow down, catch this, to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. Idols are not just these sculpted beings that they worshiped in old ancient times. It's anything that we build with our hands, that we create ourselves, that, that we're proud of, that we desire, that we choose to follow. It, it's anything that, that, our, that our hands have created. And so there's, it's not just these sculptures. I think there's some things in our own lives that maybe we've pursued or maybe we've created or maybe we like to control that have become idols in our lives. In fact, um, idols are, are, are not just created things like gods or statues anymore, but they're created things, uh, I think a lot of times in our lives and our culture, they're created ideologies, things like happiness or pleasure or fruitfulness. And we're going to look at some of these different things. And so what, what we worship binds our souls. And that's what we see that, that these Egyptians is they started to worship the creation over the creator. And that's actually bound their souls. And, and we're going to look at some different things. That Charles Spurgeon says this about idolatry. He says, if you love anything better than God, you are idolaters. If there's anything you would rather not give up for God, it is your idol. If there's anything that you seek with greater fervor than you seek the glory of God, that is your idol. And conversion means a turning from every idol. And so this is what God is trying to do with Pharaoh and the people. And I, I can't believe I've never seen this. As the many times I've read this story, I've always seen Pharaoh as the bad guy. But when you slow down and you read these plagues, what you actually see is God's redemptive nature striking down their idols one at a time, trying to redeem them, to get them to repent, to turn to him and to follow the one true God. God's not just trying to punish people that don't love him, that don't follow his ways. And it may look like punishment, it may feel like punishment, but sometimes discipline is meant to actually cause us to turn. And I, I, I'm thankful, in fact, the scripture tells us that, that when God loves someone, there's discipline attached to it. And I'm thankful for the discipline of God. I know it's uncomfortable sometimes. I know it, it could be even trying sometimes to think that God would maybe allow something hard to happen or something trying to happen. But I believe it's the goodness of God. It's the kindness of God that actually allows some of these things to happen so we can recognize I can't trust myself. I can't trust what I build. I can't trust my comforts, my controls, my desires. I can't trust these things. The only thing I can trust is God. And I think it's the goodness of God that, that breaks that up a little bit for us. It's the kindness of God that says you're not enough. It's the kindness of God that reveals to us that I'm not strong enough, that I'm not smart enough. We talked about that last week. I think it's the kindness of God that reveals those things to us. 
to recognize that it, he is strong enough, that he is good enough, and we have access to him. That these false gods, these me gods, these things over here, they will not fulfill, but he can fulfill. And I think that's the goodness of God. And so there's an inner battle that's happening inside of each one of us, a spiritual battle, if you will, between our sin nature and between God's nature, between our will and between God's word, between our desires and between God's delight. Paul talks about this in Romans. He says, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. So there's a delight in God. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. So you have a difference. There's a difference between God's law and, and the law, God's law and the law of sin, God's nature and our sin nature, God's delight and our personal desires. So there's a law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Then Paul goes on, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sin nature a slave to the law of sin. So what is he saying there? He's saying there's those two things. There's a battle that's waging war inside of us. The pursuit of our own desires and the pursuit of actually God's delight. The pursuit of our sin nature and the pursuit of God's nature. Paul says, I, like, I'm, I'm in that war, but thank, thanks be to God, because I know I'm never going to win this on my own. But because of Jesus, I can have victory. And that's the good news for us today, is that no matter what's going on in our lives, we can have freedom. We can have deliverance. This is what Paul is talking about. Even though I still struggle, I'm still free. Even though there's still things, I'm still waging war, I still can walk in freedom because of what Christ has done. And, and, and so I want to challenge you today. Maybe there's things that you've been struggling with for a long time. Maybe there's things you've been like chewing on and like you wish you didn't do and you've been trying to break habits that are addictions or different things. Maybe it's a mindset and you've been trying to move and be a better person. Don't stop waging war. Even if you don't find victory today, the good news is because of what Jesus has done, you get victory. You have victory. So keep waging war. This is what Paul goes, oh, who am I? Man, I'm wretched. I'm broken. But thanks be to God. And that's, I think it's a great place as a Christian to be. To recognize that I don't have it all together, but because of God's goodness. But I think there's a, a, a trick of the enemy that the, the longer we follow Christ, the, the more we feel like we've deserved a little bit of the grace that we have. And the more we feel like we deserve it, the less we're appreciative of it. We feel like we've earned it. And Paul, the best Christian, the best apostle, wrote most of the New Testament. I love what he says there. He goes, what a wretched man am I. I think there's, there's a place of humility that we find ourselves in, recognizing there's this war waging in between us, and we need Jesus. So in this, we see that there's 10 plagues. We're going to jump back into this. 10 plagues, 10 direct attacks on 10 specific gods. And, and, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you some different things about each one, kind of teach a little bit through this. And so the first scripture, we'll go back to this, this first plague, verse 20. It says, Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff, struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. So this brings us to our first, our first plague, the first God that God was attacking here. And, and so the, the symbol is blood here, what we see happen. And this is the goddess Happy. Um, that's, that's her name. And, and the goddess Happy was actually the goddess that they worshipped over the Nile. And what you need to know about the Nile, if you've never looked at this historically or anything, is that the Nile was everything to the Egyptians. In fact, all of their riches, all of their power, all of their success, all of their crops, everything that they did, all, everything that Pharaoh accomplished was because of the Nile. And so the very first attack, I, I, this is God and his sovereign power, the very first attack is God attacks the thing that, that, that they know is the source of all of their power. The Nile brought water down, and they, the, the goddess, the reason it was the goddess happy, and the reason we, we look at this as happiness, is they would, once a year, they'd have this huge celebration to worship the goddess happy. So when the snow would melt and the, the rains would fall, the Nile would actually fill up and actually would flood into their crops and would actually water into their crops where they didn't have to even have to go have like an irrigation system. It just would happen naturally by the seasons of the earth. And when that would happen, they would throw these huge parties and they would worship the goddess happy. Well, now all of a sudden, all of that, the source of their power, their strength, their might as a country 
is now taken away in one swoop, one swing of the staff. So this Nile was the key to their happiness. It, it was their substance. It was their wealth. It was their power. And their first attack was a direct attack on those things. Everything that they prided themselves in as a nation, everything that Pharaoh prided himself in, in one blow was brought to its knees. Their future was futile without the river. They had to have it. How much of our life do we put on this one word, happiness? Like how many decisions do we make per day, per week, that are driven off of how something makes us feel? Like the happiness factor. Like I, I've talked to so many people, and, and, and I'm not dogging anyone today. If you, we've had this conversation, I'm just using this as, a, as, a, as an overarching theme. Is I've had so many conversations with people that have quit jobs that they were getting paid in and were, were doing well in because they weren't happy at it. Like, without a, a future job in mind. Like, they didn't quit one because they had a better job ahead. They just quit it and said, I'm not sure what the future holds. I'm going to trust God. And I'm telling you, there's a thing called faith and there's a thing called being smart. You know, and those two things are not in, they don't work against each other. They work with each other. But I've seen, I've talked to tons of people that have made those type of decisions. That because they weren't happy, because they didn't enjoy something. And where we're pursuing happiness above all else. Like that's the, that's the one goal in life. Um, and, you know, I think we can put a lot of our, our feelings our, our, or a lot of our, our faith is tied up into our feelings. And so much so that our feelings dictate so much of what we do, what we pursue, what we spend money on, what we count, what we measure. Fulfillment based on feelings will always be fleeting. So if you're looking for fulfillment, for happiness, and it's based on feelings, if you've been around this earth just a few times, you recognize that life has seasons, that there's good days and there are bad days. And if I hinge all of everything that I do, my fulfillment, on my good days, the, here's the thing that's going to happen. When a bad day comes, where's my faith? When a bad day comes, what's shaken? What, what's moved? What's stirred? But when I can put and hang my hat on Jesus and put my faith in Jesus, even when bad days come, when bad things happen, I can find myself staying joyful in those seasons. Uh, John 15 says this, 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy might be in you. These are the words of Jesus. And that your joy may be full. So Jesus goes, it's my desire that you would have joy, that my joy would be in you and that it would be full. Jesus also goes, says this, says this, or Paul says it was for the joy that was set before Jesus. Paul says this about Jesus. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Jesus went to the cross and he had a seed of joy in his soul, knowing that the sacrifice, the pain, the suffering, the torment he was about to, to take for you and me was actually there was a seed of joy in his heart because he knew once he went through that, he was going to get to spend eternity with his creation. There was a joy set before him, even in suffering. Look at the story of Paul. He's in prison, and him and, him and uh, one of his buddies are singing songs and worshiping. Then all of a sudden, the shackles break off. Like, there's stories that we can look at over and over again where we can see that the joy of the Lord resides even in the middle of suffering. It's not adjusted by suffering. It doesn't flee because bad things happen. And, and, and this, but the people of, of Egypt... When this river turns to blood, they flip the lid, man. Why? Because their happiness was, on, was set on something temporal. Their happiness was set on something they, they felt like they had control over, but the reality is they didn't have any control over it at all. True joy, I believe, is found only in the fulfillment of Christ. This is what, this is what Jesus was saying. It's like, when you find me, you find joy, and that joy will be full. Meaning that we can find a fulfillment of joy. We can actually have joy all the time when we're in Christ. All other joy is temporal and susceptible to our circumstances. But the joy of the world, it can, the joy of the Lord can actually withstand the pressures of this world. So let's keep reading. Exodus 8. It says, that, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I'll a plague... Behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your beds. 
and into your houses of your servants and your people, and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. Can you imagine just a bunch of frogs cooking all over its town? I mean, just disgusting. You thought the, the river stank. The frogs shall come up on you. So many frogs that they're actually coming up on you and your people and all of your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So this brings us to our second plague, which was the, the plague of frogs. And they actually, the, the Egyptians had a goddess, is goddess Hecate, is how you say that. And it was a god that actually had a frog head. And so this goddess would, and you can look back, you can look at these, some crazy pictures of these drawings of these different goddesses. They actually had one that had a frog head. And it actually stood for fruit, fruitfulness or fruit, um, um, uh, what's the word here? I'm trying to think, fertility. There's another F word. Fertility. So fruitfulness or fertility. So frogs, the, their idea and the reason they, they built this, this frog thing is because the frogs, there was just always frogs. And they always multiplied. And so they thought that there was some sort of fertility god or some sort of thing magical about the frog that it just always just multiplied. There was always more frogs. So God said, I thought you thought there was a lot of frogs. Just wait. And sends millions of frogs into town. And so frogs come from the river and this, this goddess of fruitfulness. So their idea was that frogs multiply. The Nile feeds, feed, like the Nile's the power. It feeds everything. And so these frogs are the thing that multiply out of the river. So that it was a, kind of a goddess that was attached to the, to the other goddess. And, and the idea that the Nile River feeded and, and multiplied, but then these frogs multiplied out of it. And that's where you get the goddess of fruit, fertility or the goddess of fruitfulness. And so the idea here is this fruitfulness, this idea and the fertility is that, that we can create new life. And that's why they would worship her, and that's why they would, they would make sacrifices to her for new life. If a, if a, if a mom or a, a wife was having trouble being pregnant, they would go and make sacrifices to goddess Hecate because they wanted new life. They wanted new things. They wanted to create new things in their life. And so much they were consumed with new. They were consumed with fertility. They were consumed with fruitfulness. In fact, you were, you were marked blessed if you had children. If you couldn't have children, you were marked cursed. And that was how they really believed. And so it was a blessing to be able to multiply, to be able to create new things. And so we can pull from this, and this attack that God sent on this God was to attack what they felt like they had control over again, was their ability to create. That we, I think so, so many times we can be consumed with what we create, what we've built, what we've contributed to. Our, our worth can be, can be summed up into our works. We build, we toil, we create. We analyze, we dream, we produce, and we, we take great pride in people noticing what we have created. We do. As, as a people, we do. We take great pride in this. We, in fact, we've allowed a spirit of fruitfulness to supersede the fruits of the spirit. I'm going to say that again. As a society, we've allowed a spirit of fruitfulness, of creating, of, of, of adding to or working with or controlling things with our hands, being, being people who produce things that are noticeable. We've allowed that spirit of fruitfulness to supersede the fruits of the spirit in our life. Where we've pursued making something that matters over actually being who God's called us to be and living a life that matters. And we've placed producing over people. We've placed producing over worship. We've placed producing and achieving and winning over the things of God. Generosity and, and serving and loving and compassion and kindness. In our society, we've done it. And this is what this is a direct attack on. And as long as we produce something, this is kind of the feeling that, that I think this is, this is what this God, this attack on this God is happening. As long as we produce something of great worth, we have a feeling that we'll be worth something great. As long as we can produce something of great worth, we have this feeling that then we'll be worth something great. And this is essentially what was happening in their culture, in their context. If you're a woman and you can have a, a child, you were blessed. But if you couldn't create a child, then you were cursed. And some of those things run parallel today and some of those same feelings and same pressures happen. But it's broader than just childbearing. It's anything that we create, anything we feel like we can control. As long as we can produce something great, then maybe we'll be worth something great. 
But fruitfulness is not something we create. In fact, fruitfulness, we know through God's word, is someone we know. Fruitfulness is not something we create, but it's someone we know. The fruit of the Spirit is the outcome of being filled with God's Spirit. And so we see joy. We talked about that just a second ago. Happiness, true happiness is found when? Is when we're full of God. Fruitfulness is found when? When we're full of God. What is God attacking right here? He's attacking their feeling and control of happiness. God is attacking this God uh, of here, of this God of frogs, this God of fruitfulness. What is God doing? God is calling to these people, repent, turn away from your gods, and follow me, the one true God. The thing that you have a piece of that you feel like is so valuable that you want to hold on to, you're just holding a piece. And that peace is going to break, it's going to fall away, and it's not going to be worth what you thought it was. But I have everything. I have all happiness. I have all joy. I have all fruitfulness. I have the fruits of the Spirit. Everything that you think you have, you just have a piece of it, and it's broken, and it will fade. But I have all of it over here. And this is what's happening. This is what God is doing, and God is showing these people. But let's keep reading. Here's the next plague. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice with the Lord. So now Pharaoh is bargaining. I mean, you got to have, you got some audacity to bargain with God. To think that, that like, hey, I'm, this is how, how powerful Pharaoh believed he was. That he could actually bargain with the one true God. He says, so, hey, go and tell God, like, to take away the frogs. And if you do that, then I'll let you guys worship. That's what he's doing. So Moses said to Pharaoh, be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs will be cut off from you in your house and will be left only in the Nile. And he said, tomorrow. So Pharaoh goes, yeah, okay, go plead for God, ask God to stop it, and when he does, then tomorrow I'll let you worship is what's happening here. So verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. When Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, so now that tragedy, that, that suffering, that pain has gone away, and what does Pharaoh do? He goes right back to his old ways. He says he hardened his heart and would not listen to him, so he didn't let him sacrifice. So verse 16, then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff again. This time we're going to strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all of the land of Egypt. So the next plague is the plague of the gnats. So this is the god Geb. And you think about gnats, millions and millions of gnats, and one translation reads lice, and the idea here is it's just a very, very small insect that is literally attaching itself and, and landing on and pestering people. Millions of them everywhere. So the god Geb is the god of the desert or god of the earth, and this is how God responds to that. God takes the staff, tells Moses, tells Aaron to take a staff and strike the earth. And when he does, the dust comes up. And when the dust comes up, it turns to gnats. I mean, that's pretty cool right there. Like, we need, if there's not a movie, we need to make a movie on these plagues. It's pretty cool stuff. And so that's what happens. So they're worshiping the God of earth. And God says, I have control over the earth. In fact, I can make the earth do something that's not even supposed to do. I can make dust rise up and turn to gnats. So these gnats go and they attack the people. Well, for them, the desert, the, the ground, the soil meant, meant comfort because it produ produced food for them. It produced uh, shade for them. Like the soil was, was something they worshipped because just like the Nile was something that gave them power and control and made them bigger and stronger than any other nation around them. And so there's these gnats and they come in and they're attacking, uh, they're, they're covering and pestering every living thing. This goes on to tell us that. If you keep reading, it says that in the picture that we have of the Egyptians, this is really key. And if you look at the history and the context, the picture we have of, of Egyptians that they've painted of themselves. So this isn't our perspective. This is their perspective of themselves. There's a bunch of shirtless dudes in little bath towels, right, being fed grapes and waved like, you know, got the little palm leaves, like giving them a little breeze, right? That's the picture we have. Like that's the picture they wrote of themselves. They worshiped comfort. Like they were, they were proud that they had things, modern technology and things that the rest of the world didn't have. In fact, so much that they celebrated, they, they painted it for everyone to see that would come in or come through. That what you only think, it, it, you only think or dream about, we actually partake in regularly. Like what you have fought your whole life to maybe taste for a moment, it's our normal everyday life. We sit around shirtless eating grapes, have hot women fan us with, you know, leaves and stuff. Like that's normal here. 
And that's the picture they would paint of themselves. They worship comfort. And the next God, God sends, God attacks this God and removes all the comfort. It didn't, like, it didn't, the gnats didn't go land, like, they weren't particular, like, oh, you make too much money, I'm not going to land on you. Oh, you've got a nicer carriage than the other guy down the road, I'm not going to land on you. The gnats attacked everyone. And they, they, they disrupted the comfort. Swarming uncontrollable gnats removed the comfort and peace from the entire nation. So we spend, as, as a society, we spend piles of money on comfort. And in fact, um, you know, there's a, a couple of years ago, my wife was seeing a chiropractor, and I didn't even ask her for permission to share the story, so I might get in trouble later. But I'm going to do it for a service, and I'll maybe have to delete this later. But she went to a chiropractor, was having some problems with her neck and stuff, and the chiropractor told her, like, you need to buy this special pillow. And so she's got this fancy pillow that, like, is, like, it's super squishy but firm. It's, like, this really weird, it's like memory foam but not memory foam. It's way nicer than that. And so it's not the Walmart memory foam. This is, like, from the chiropractor, right? Or she ordered it online or something. She's shaking her head no. I'm telling the story wrong. But anyways, all I know is this, is that it, it helped her sleep at night. That, that purchase, that investment was actually helpful to her. But it was so helpful to her, and it was so great to her that she never even considered buying me one, by the way. I still don't have one to this day, and nor do I ever get to use it. But, you know, I don't know about you, but we do. We spend money. Like, my parents have one of those beds you can control. Like, my dad and my mom have different controls of their beds. Like, like we spend a lot of money on comfort. Like, it's a part of our society. We're not just focused on having a roof over our head. We're actually spending time and dollars and hours and inventive creative power on how to make a bed slightly more comfortable if I move this button and lift this and raise that and lower that, firmer here, softer here. I mean, it's crazy. And that's what was exactly what was happening here is that these people were worshiping comfort and this attack came onto the comfort of their souls. And so then we'll keep reading here. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes up to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Get in a rhythm here. Uh, Moses keeps going with these plagues and Pharaoh keeps asking him to stop and making these promises and then recants it and then now here we are again. And so Moses tells them, if you don't or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people. And into your houses and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of fly. And also on the ground on which they stand. So many flies that you can't even walk and take a step without stepping on flies. I don't know about you, but we we had, or we were coming back from vacation a couple days ago from Colorado. We had one fly in our Yukon. And that fly caused so much torment to our family for an hour Because it was slow moving, it was like, you know, almost dead, and you thought you could hit it, but we couldn't hit it, even with my mad ninja reflexes. And we rolled down windows, like, it would land on the window, we'd roll down the window and think, oh, it got sucked out, and like, it's good, we're good. Then all of a sudden, five minutes later, we're here again, buzzing around. Like, that's one fly. Imagine billions of them, to the point where when you step on the ground, you're stepping on flies. This is what God sent. This was the next plague. And so, this... But on that day, he says, I'll set apart. So this is something unique that happens here. So up until this point, all of the plagues have been happening to everyone. But God says, that's enough. At this point, I will set apart the land of Goshen, which is where the Israelites live, where my people dwell. So no swarm of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. So God says this, not only am I in control of the entire earth, I can control when and where and who it affects. So God is revealing not just his power over all creation, but to its specific details. No fly will go in the homes of those people. That's how powerful God is showing himself to be. And so God does this thing, and he sets all the flies to just the Egyptians, but all the Israelites have no flies. And so this is, there's literally a fly God, um, and there's different ways that I looked up the pronouncements of this, but I'll just let you read it and make up your own in your head there, because I'm not going to try but the goddess of this, yacht, yacht, that looks like a weird way to say yacht, right? And so this was the goddess of pleasure, the goddess of pleasure. The fly god was the god of music, the god of dancing, the god of love, the god of beauty, the goddess of pleasure. See, this plague was the first plague, like I said, it didn't affect the Israelites. There was a separation in God revealing his power and control. But this one, in my opinion, this plague hits deep, at least to me. Uh, because I, I don't know about you guys, but I, a lot of my life is consumed by pleasure. 
uh, by me pursuing the things that I like. Not just that bring me happiness, but things, especially for me, food. Like, it's something like food is my love language. Like, if you want to say you love me, take me somewhere good to eat. And I'm not talking chain restaurant. Take me to some secret hole in the wall that I've never been to. If you want to say, John, I, I love you, you're a great pastor, take me some hole in the wall, like Vietnamese restaurant or something. Like, that's my love language. When I can smell those things, I can taste those things, there's, like, that's, that's something that brings me great, great pleasure. In fact, on our date nights and on our vacations, that's the thing we talk the most about. Where are we going to eat? It's not where are we going, what are we going to do with the kids? It's like, yeah, but what are we going to eat between that thing and this thing? And I'll have you know that I was in Colorado Springs, and we had In-N-Out three times, I think, in four days, something like that. And so if you never had In-N-Out, it's, it's, a, it's a national treasure. Um, but pleasure, <laughs> pleasure, it's, it, it, it's the thing that we pursue that feels good to us. And each one of us have different things that feels good to us. But in our society, we've, we've, we've created this new perspective on pleasure, and it's this. If it feels good to you, and it doesn't hurt anyone else, then you be you. We've created this, this pleasure, we've lifted pleasure up as a God. If it feels good to you and it doesn't hurt anyone else, then you be you. Another way it was said is, is you've seen this on stickers or flags, different things, this love is love. Like, we can't de de depict what's right and wrong for other people. As long as it doesn't hurt other people, we shouldn't get involved in those things. We shouldn't have anything to say about those things. The problem with that is that it may be true for us. Maybe we shouldn't be digging in everyone's businesses. But God's word has a lot to say about what pleasures are good and what pleasures are not good. God's word has a lot of boundaries for us. Whether we like them or not, God says this is true and this is not true. This is good. This is not good. And we can't define good. Actually, let me just read this scripture. This is Paul. It says, some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed and you were made holy. He's talking about sexual immorality above this. You are holy. You are made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. And this is, this is key right here. He says this. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become slave to anything. So Paul says, even though the things may be permissible, even though things may feel good to us, there's a line in the sand, maybe it's with food, maybe it's with uh, whatever it may be in your life. There's a line in the sand where we got to go, is this, is this, it may feel good to me, but is it actually good by what God's word says? Is God's word define as this? In fact, this is the way that I say, just because something feels good doesn't make it good. It's essentially what Paul is saying here. Just because something feels good doesn't make it good. We can't allow our feelings, again, happiness, fruitfulness, we can't allow our feelings to be our God. Either God is God or we are God, but both cannot be God. I can't pursue what I want, how I feel, what makes me happy, because when I pursue that above God, like Charles Spurgeon said, that thing has become God. So as long as those pursuits, and this is what's happening in Egypt, as long as those people are pursuing these things, then God cannot be God. And that's why God is attacking those things, to show that he is the God of all pleasure. Everything that is good and feels good, God created it. But he also created a right and a wrong way to do it. He also created boundaries for those things, uh, healthy boundaries for those things. Maybe we don't understand it, but we have to trust it. We have to follow him. He either is God or he is not God. So Pharaoh allows Moses and Aaron after this sacrifice. He goes, I know I told you you can make a sacrifice before, but now I really mean it. He, he recanted, so he tells them, says, you can go make a sacrifice. Just don't go very far. Stay close and appease to God. Ask God to stop the flies. So still, catch this. Pharaoh is bargaining with God, still holding his position of power. This is what Pharaoh's position. And as soon as God removed the flies, wouldn't you have it, Pharaoh reneges again. Pharaoh says this, but when Pharaoh hardened his heart this time, and the scripture says, also. So again, God stopped this plague. God stopped this thing. Pharaoh says, if you stop it, then we'll worship. I'll let you worship. And as soon as it has stopped, then Pharaoh goes all the way back to his hardened heart stakes. So Exodus 9. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall on you very severe plague, with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. 
so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time saying, tomorrow, this is funny, this is, I love this, is God. God, Pharaoh told Moses and, and, and Aaron, says that, hey, if you stop the gnats, tomorrow I'll let you make a sacrifice. And then he recanted, right? So now here's God. <laughs> hey, so I'm going to do this thing. When am I going to do it? Tomorrow. Like, I think God is almost like proving his power. He's telling Pharaoh, like, you think you're in control. You think because you yanked back on this and you, you're playing with the days, you're in control. But I, I'm actually in control of the days. Tomorrow, this is going to happen. The Lord will do this thing. And the next day, the Lord will do this thing. And all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And so we see this next, this next and this final plague that we're going to talk about today is livestock. And this is the god Apis. And for them, this was a, a god that had a bull head. Um, they, they, they worshiped this god with a bull head. And for them, livestock meant success. Different people could have grain. Some people could have water or houses. But if you had a livestock, if you had living animals, that means you had enough grain. It means you had enough water. It means you had enough land that not only could you stay alive, not only could your servants stay alive, but also you could, you could feed an animal with it. And you could feed an animal with the intent to make it fat and to kill it and eat it. Amen? Barbecues. Anyone? Anyone? No. Okay. So that was, that was a sign of success. If you had a fat cow, you were a rich dude. I mean, that, that was how they proved their power. That was how they proved their success. And you, you can see this as you read through the Bible when it says our God is a God of a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. It's the essence that God is all powerful and God has all the resources. And what we like cling to hold on to, pieces here and there, God has all of it. And we look at the story of Abraham, you get different people in the Bible, it will number, tell you how many piece, heads of cattle they had or how many of this they had. That was to signify their, their favor, their wealth, their success. And so here's favor or here's Pharaoh and the people, of Israel, is, uh, the people of Egypt, excuse me, and they've got all this cattle. And in one fell swoop, all of it's dead, except for the people of Israel's. Pharaoh, in his own mind, is like a god. He's bargaining with God. I mean, he's maneuvering chips around on a table with Moses and Aaron. If you do this, then I'll do this. And he's not talking with Moses and Aaron. Moses is just talking. He's a, he's a mediator. So in essence, Pharaoh has elevated himself to a godlike figure. And he believes that because the power, the success, the wealth, the strength. In fact, these pharaohs, these kings, they were buried with more wealth than any one of you will ever touch. Any one of me, any one of us. These guys were buried with more money than we'll ever make in our lifetimes. These guys were successful and rich beyond measure. But when tragedy hit, you would see Pharaoh's heart shift over and over as we read these plagues. He would go to him and say, hey, 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 would you go pray to your God? He would all of a sudden start to show honor to God because of tragedy. But then when there was respite, when there was rest, when, they, when the tragedy had ceased, all of a sudden he re-elevated himself back to honoring himself. And we see this in our own lives, that when tragedy happens, many of us, we go to honor God. I don't know about you, but I pray a lot of fervent prayers when things are tough. I, we go to God and we say, God, would you do something? God, would you make a way where it seems like there's no way? God, I don't have control over this. I need you. I need your help in this situation. And then God, in his power and his grace and his love towards us, he works out situations. There's things in our life, each one of us, if we could take enough time and consider, you could probably see where God has moved. Where you prayed a prayer, God had moved. But what happens is when respite happens, when the tragedy dissolves, all of a sudden we start to honor ourselves again. And it's not that hard to forget what God has done when it looks like all of this that I have done. I did all of this, it fell apart, I asked God to do this one thing, he did this one thing, but I did all of this. And this is where Pharaoh finds himself, where he's recognizing the power of God, but then he also feels like he still has a little bit of control left. He still has a little bit of, of his life left. You know, as, as believers, we can say, we can look at the story of Pharaoh and Egyptians, and it's easy, and I've done this my whole life, to look at them as the bad guys. But I asked you at the beginning, could you consider that maybe you might maybe fit into some of these categories, that maybe some of these struggles that were happening in the hearts of man then 
are still happening in the hearts of man now. You see, I believe we aren't better than these people because we are these people. Like these, this, this is us, it's the heart of humanity. Like we, we pursue happiness. We worship the God of fruitfulness. We worship the God uh, of, of pleasure and the God of success and the God of comfort. We, we treasure those things. We work hard for those things. We pursue those things at all costs. But when creation begins to turn its back on us, we feel powerless. And this is what happens with Pharaoh. Creation, the things that he thought he had control of, all of a sudden he realizes that the God of the universe is actually in control. I'm not in control of the Nile. I'm not in control of the frogs or the gnats or the flies or the livestock. I thought I was building rivers and infrastructures and, and, and duct systems to feed and water and doing all the things. I thought I was mighty and that our people had created and we were so smart and we had used all these things, but all of a sudden the God of all creation steps in, the creator of the universe and starts messing with things, all of a sudden he feels powerless. And I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I've felt this way a lot in the last year and a half, two years. Like, I've looked at my own life, and I've felt powerless many times. I, COVID has done that to many of us. I mean, this season, this, this sickness, this disease, I know you're tired of hearing about it, and I've, I've not said that word out loud for months now, so I, I feel like I can say it again. Um, but the reality is, like, it's, it's stripped us from some control. Some of the things that, that brought us happiness were, were stripped from us. I'm a people person. And when we got sent home and to work at our homes, like I love my people, I love my kids, I love my wife, but only seeing them all day long, like it weared on me, like it wore on me. Like I love being out, you'll see me in coffee shops and restaurants and stuff, because I love to work and be around people. Like that war, that was part of my happiness. I was hanging my joy on my connections with people, not my connection with God. So when that went fleeting, I'm just being honest here, when that disappeared, all of a sudden I found myself with not very much joy in my heart. I found myself being quick to anger. I found myself even in a se se season of depression. I didn't know what, I'd never been depressed before, but I, I could tell now looking back on it, I was depressed. I was not, not going to sleep at night, not waking up early in the morning. I would work all day and not accomplish anything. Those are all signs of depression. In the moment, I didn't see it. I just thought I was just dealing with it like everyone else. But if I'm real with you today, I had some gods in my life that, that, that moment of powerlessness revealed them to me. And maybe you in this last season, you've, you've, you've kind of seen yourself for who you really are and you don't like it. I know I've been there where I've looked in the mirror and this season because it stripped me of my control, it stripped me of my success and the things that I thought I had a hold of, all of a sudden I realized I don't have a hold on it. All of a sudden I realized control does not bend to my will <laughs> and that creation has not bend to my will, excuse me. And I felt powerless. And I, I believe we find ourselves in a season of this and it's revealed the true nature of who we are. The season has revealed the weakness of our idols. Like the things that we've pursued, pleasure, happiness, all these different things, to me at least, it's revealed how weak those things and fragile those things actually are. That I can hope that they'll be good and I can, I can see that there's a trajectory and it's going this way and, and all these things are happening, but the reality is when those things start to move or shift or break down and I see the fragility of them, if I'm not careful, if I've elevated those things, now I have nothing to hold on and I feel powerless because what I thought I had control of, I no longer have control of. But what if the thing I was holding on to was the creator himself, the one who actually has control, the one that actually bends creation to his will. When those things shift and those things fall and those things break and those things seem fragile, I go, that's okay because he's in control because he is the creator of those things. And if I hold on to him, I can trust that I'm gonna make it through this season. Much like the disciples in the boat when the storm was raging, they went and woke up, Jesus said, we're all gonna die. And what the, all they needed to do is just say, Jesus, stand up and speak. Be still and the storm will end. Like we can have that kind of faith. We serve that kind of God that when the whole rest of the world is in chaos and things are disrupting because the things that we thought we had, the gods that we had been worshiping are falling and, and cracking and dismembering, we can say we worship the one true God that when he speaks and says be still, everything is still. When he speaks and says COVID be gone, COVID can be gone. When he speaks and says be blessed, you can be blessed. When he speaks and says be healed, you can be healed. When he speaks and says be restored, you can be restored. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we worship. He bends creation to his will. 
But too often than not, we are over here worshiping the creation. And then in its fragility, it just leaves us in this roller coaster of a mess. But I believe, church, that we're in a season uh, of revival, not just for our world, but for the church. I believe that we're approaching a season uh, of, of spiritual reformation in us. God is attacking our idols, our idols right now. Like we've got a modern day plague happening right now, li literally, but also spiritually. And God is attacking our idols and saying that you've been worshiping these things, even inside the church. We've been worshiping these things, but no more. I stand alone as the one true God. He's calling us to worship him. He's calling us to draw close to him, just like the people in Egypt. He was calling them to repent from their gods and turn to him. I believe that's what God is doing with us today. Just as God is giving Abraham, or Pharaoh excuse me, opportunities to turn from his idols, I believe God is giving us that same opportunity. Let me pray for you today.